<laughs> we, we can try with German. Yes. <laughs> Well, it's nice to see everybody. It looks like you got a nice crowd already coming up to join us. But I wish people would show their pictures because uh, their face is nice to see people. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to uh, put out um, the website so everyone knows again. So Jeb and Tiziana, who's going to present first for the Jeb, for Team Canada? Quien, uh, tú Porque no me sé el orden. Yo, ah, pero entonces dime cuál es el orden. Mándame, mándame ahí. Ah, perdón. Luis, do, do you do this every uh, every Friday? A Salmo Sud? Um, the lectures? Yeah. Are every day. Every day. Yeah. Glaucoma is at 11.30. And wow. Cornea is at 5.30 p.m. Oh, and then this is special? Yeah, it's a special. Oh. Actually, glaucoma and cornea are combined now. <laughs> okay. Yes, okay. Also, the guests are special. Yes, of course. <laughs> it's always going to be fun. Ike, great meeting this morning on on tips and tricks. It was fun. I I, I learned. I enjoyed it. Um, you know, uh, there's like so much to. So how deep can you go with uh, with this video stuff? So it's pretty cool. Yes, spending a lot of money. Huh? <laughs> it can be, but I was pretty impressed with uh, with some of the low budget solutions that people were showing. I saw that. Uh, you can really rig up uh, with a camera and an adapter and do pretty well so I was impressed in fact I just sent the link to my fellows we said we we're gonna buy some adapters for our slit lamps and stuff definitely yes that angle surgeries you saw from Dr. Hara yes great great images great stuff. I know he's he's an attend he's an artist very nice all them are very nice Juan Carlos is going to show some some of these angle surgeries for us today, tonight. A week. Some oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Really, that's a treat. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, I love that procedure. So we are going to wait a little bit, just uh, probably another five minutes, just for the people just to connect, uh -huh. uh, just to get ready and. Um, We'll start. So okay, Mauro, how are you? Fine, and you? How is it? Us. Yeah, yeah. Frederico, Tala, perfecto. So, I do you have a Brazilian fellow too? Oh yes, she's Canadian now. She's Canadian now. She, uh, she <laughs> she's coming to the dark side. <laughs> yes, yeah, so Cristiana. Cristiana, uh, see you there. Hi everyone. Hello. Hello, Tiziana. Hola. Hola. Is that Brazilian or is that Spanish? Hola. Hola. Works for both. Okay. You know, you can tell the truth. Of course, if, if you miss the tropical weather, or maybe you don't <laughs> like how I teach. No, you, you are free to talk. You are free to speak. <laughs> <laughs> I, I give I give I, I give all my fellows drugs so they always say the right thing. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> we can keep it that. <laughs> and we can keep it that. <laughs> and we and, and so we have um who is presenting uh for uh for Brazil? We have uh Danielle yeah. and Marilia. And Mar Marilia. And Marilia. Hello. 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 <laughs> Yeah, it's good to know you guys. So Daniel and and Marilia. I, I don't know. Marilia, if I'm still here. Great. Yeah, yeah, it's Marilia. Marilia. <laughs> the Portuguese is excellent because my fellow is teaching me lots of Portuguese this year. Você mm -hmm. entende português? Oh, he does. And then, and then on the per, on the Peruvian side, we have who we have Mir Mirel and Cristobal. Yes. Hi, I'm Mirel. How are you? You're Mirel. Oh, yeah, say hello 
I don't see you guys. Yeah. I'm here. I'm Mirel. Hello yeah, to everyone. Is there. Oh, nah, really happy Cristobal to be here. is uh, sleeping. No. Yeah, Cristobal, maybe, maybe he's sleeping, but he doesn't appear. Where's Cristobal? He's right there. He's right there. Where are you, Cristobal? If, if, if Cristobal oh, doesn't appear, he's he going to sleep forever. Yeah, he's going to sleep forever. <laughs> he, he doesn't appear. So. Or probably, probably cooking. Oh, yeah, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so this is going to be a nice format. We're going to have our cases presented, and then we're going to have our some faculty making comments. And yeah, now now will you be, will you comment on on Canada's cases as well? I mean, right? Yeah, that could be fun. I, I, so we can use everybody, you know, because maybe there are different techniques or different approach, and uh -huh. you can share with everybody. That could be really fun. Cool. Oh, I see. We have Lupita here. Lupita, turn your turn your video on. Hi, Ike. Hi. How are you? You? Hey. Let me see your popsicle you're having. Wow, that's good. Wow. It's that's a delicious. gancho. So, Lupita, what what is that called? A popsicle? Gancho. No, no. Paleta. 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 Paleta helada. Is it cold? Yes, yeah. it's a mandarina. It's nice. like a popsicle. Very nice. <laughs> so nice. Have... Hello to everybody. Thank you. Oh. And Lupita, we have a course coming up on um, next week. Tuesday. Tuesday. It's about, next it's Tuesday. About, it's about making mistakes. Exactly. Learning everyone, from our mistakes. Yeah, it's basically everyone making mistakes. I have to fix their mistakes. That's what it's about. <laughs> Everybody, everybody's invited at 4 o'clock Mexican time, 5 o'clock Toronto time. And we will be there. We are like careful, 25 people. Be careful, Lewis is going to charge you for advertising on his on his channel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. You have which to is send my more, friend. Which is my friend. <laughs> you have to send more ice cream for us, you know. Yes. But I, I think maybe we can send also some tacos and, and maybe some tequila too. Right? Some right. tequila and right? mezcal. Yeah. Okay, a mezcal. That's very good. <laughs> well, the next the next Friday, Lupita, she are going to stay with us. Ah, you have also to... Yes, you with uh, have, Filomena Rivello, Yeah, for uh, sure. Women power. Okay, yeah, women yeah. power, of course. Ah, ah it's true, this Friday. And, and yes. Elena Barraquer, yeah, the next Friday. Did you listen to that, Ike? Uh, I, 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 <laughs> Are you calling me saying that girls on power? Yes, just girls. Ike? I'm going to crash girl. that party. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we're gonna have a ladies ladies website <laughs> oh wow women power and only who's invited only one so well elena barraquer bruna filomena ribeiro no but I mean, attendees can anybody listen or only it's only for a woman no no <laughs> it's for everybody it's for everybody <laughs> yeah you know gave us the pressure the pressure of just being for women Oh great! Yes, that's nice. That's I only my, my only you know job is gonna be to open the Zoom because <laughs> they're gonna do that all the job, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it's okay. Don't worry. No, that's gonna it's great. It's great, Lupita. That I think it's gonna be We're great. We're gonna dress up for you. Oh yeah, wow! Okay. Yeah. Okay. We're gonna put some nice suits and everything. Nice. That's nice. That's Lots nice. of perfume and everything. Send us the link. Send us the link. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the perfume. I'm definitely gonna remember that. <laughs> okay, guys. Okay, nice. guys. So, empezamos. Yes. So the idea will be to uh, start to present the cases, and then, of course, uh, maybe the fellow can uh, ask, you know, to, to stop the video or whatever and say and do some questions if they want, how it's going to be, for example, the approach, whatever you want. The idea is to, you know, to share the case and hear other opinions too. Okay. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. So, yeah, the, as Dr. Luis just said, uh, the format today is going to be a little bit different than the usual format that we have in Ophthalmosalud. Uh, cases, uh, I mean, presentations. So this afternoon we will have uh, three different groups. One from Brazil uh, with Dr. Mauro Campos, Dr. Federico Franca. From Canada, Dr. Ike Ahmed. 
Y from uh, Peru, el Dr. Luis Izquierdo, Maria, Mario de la Torre y Juan Carlos Izquierdo. So every single group is going to present some different cases, difficult cases, clinical cases. And then we will discuss within the cases how the situation approach and, and probably different uh, opinions that we have uh, regarding those cases, right? So we will start with Dr. Mauro Campos and Dr. Federico Franca um, from Escuela Paulista. Dr. Mauro Campos uh, is, uh, is the uh, chief of the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences in the uh, Escuela Paulista de Medicina in Sao Paulo. Uh, and Federico Franca is right now, uh, uh, sorry, it's, uh, it's, uh, man, it's in, 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 in Portuguese. I don't understand. Sorry. <laughs> I'm in the, in the it's uh, the Institute of Cataract and, and, and Surgery, and it's, uh, uh, I don't know. Help. I'm sorry. Say. I don't understand this. In, in, is, uh, they send me say. the CV in Portuguese. <laughs> I'm so say, sorry. Say in Portuguese. Say in Portuguese. Man, I don't speak Portuguese. <laughs> <laughs> After a pisco sour, you can speak everything. So. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so we will start with them. Um, probably Dr. Mauro and Federico, they can present uh, your speakers. And then we will continue with Dr. Ike, Ahmed, and then with, um, with our doctors right here in Peru. Dr. Oh, Mauro. Before I had. Okay, good. Um, should I start? Uh, yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, can you see well? <laughs> uh, are you are you listening to me well? Yes, Daniel. All right. Okay. So, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniel. I'm a former fellow of the surgical optics sector from UNIFESP, that is Escuela Paulista de Medicina. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, this great name of ophthalmology together on the same screen. Um, I'm going to present a case tonight that was very important uh, on my fellowship program. So I, I was a fellow on this case. And so, uh, the case is about a male patient, uh, 73 years old, uh, born and living in Sao Paulo, Brazil. He was referred to me after a complication in his cataract surgery. Um, it, it's kind of common complication since this is a teaching stu institution, there is a lot of residents still learning. So when this kind of complications happens, uh, usually the, the patient is referred to a doctor of the fellowship program to uh, undergo a more uh, complex uh, intervention. So, so this patient underwent a facoconstriction surgery in which occurred a rupture of the posterior capsule with dropped length fragments and that was converted into a extra capsular vasectomy. So uh, on the recurrent day, he underwent a posterior pars plana vitrectomy in order to recover the lens fragments and remove the vitreous that was present in uh, the anterior chamber. So uh, usually when this happens, the lens fixation is performed at the same time, but uh, due to uh, high blood pressure and clinical conditions, the retinal surgeon decided to be less invasive and shorten the surgery and the patient was left a fake. So on, the, on his first appointment with me, the patient had undercorrected visual acuity of 20, 100 on the right eye, that was his other eye, and with correction, he reached 2070 due to a, a cataract. And on the left eye, he was hand motion, and with correction, he, he reached 2050. Uh, 50. So um, he had uh, in this eye a lot of areas of iris atrophy, some sternal corneal opacity on the upper region of the cornea uh, due to the sutures that were made on the extracapsular vasectomy, and he was a fake kick. So he, he had some EPR atrophy, some macular drosen, and not significant lesions. 
So uh, I dis well, we decided to perform a sclerofixation of the lens. Uh, I chose the Yamani technique. I chose sincerely uh, because I thought it was a good case for me to practice since I was in my fellowship program. Uh, I had done the surgery twice before. And the patient was a good case and no longer had vitreous or capsule, uh, or, or in which could really make it easier. So let me open the video here. Okay, are you seeing well? Yeah, it's perfect. So uh, we started the surgery making the spots where I would later insert the needles, which is uh, two millimeters away from the limbus, and then two millimeters away again, making an L on both sides. So uh, I did a um, side port and fairly uh, where the anterior, anterior chamber maintainer was inserted. Uh, I think it, it's nice to do it uh, with an oblique uh, incision to maintain the stability. So it won't go off uh, during the surgery. So I inserted the needle on the point uh, that, that was previous, previously marked uh, and being sure to make it a tunnel, spare tunnel inside uh, towards the second and the third points that were marked. So uh, I think one tip here, uh, a tip that Yamani himself gave during his visit here in Brazil, it is to make a principal incision superiorly not uh, like uh, 135 degrees like in FACO and oh. so uh, on the original technique what you do um, is, is usually put the, the IOL inside the eye and then with uh, a, a forcep you, you put it inside the needle. Uh, it's not uh, so a tip here is to put the, the, the aptic inside the needle with the IOL still folded inside the injector. So I think it's one of the many modified Yamani techniques. So uh, I think Yamani technique is it's an awesome technique on the, on the videos after you did them a lot. It makes you think that you can perform, perform the surgery in 15 minutes. It sure can be one of the better techniques on the hand of experienced surgeons, but uh, um, not as easy to learn as it seems. So this video here is the real life surgery. So my colleague who was assisting me was holding the first needle with the aptic inside. As you can see, I, I, I didn't pull it yet. Um, so I, I, was, I was inserting the second aptic uh, in the second needle. Um, I think this is, is the most tricky part because when you pull the needle at both sides, uh, theoretically you have to do it uh, at the same time and uh, you have to have four hands because when the aptic is exposed to the sclera, you have to hold them right on time so they don't slide and go inside again. And this is what happens here. So the IOL almost dropped now. So, uh, I, I, I got the other act on time, so, um, so uh, what I did here is to cauterize the, the edge of the aptic in order to guarantee that the IOL would not drop, so on, on the right side of this video. And then I had to put the needle again on the aptic on the left side of the video, and I think a good way to get the first aptic uh, without using the injector itself, like uh, I said before, is to do a side port incision on the other side of the eye. So you can get a good exposure like I'm, I'm doing here, as you can see. So this is the original technique. So you, you, you go with a micro forcep, like a retina forcep on the other side and get the first aptic and put inside the needle. So it's not easy as, as we think. You have to get on the edge of the aptic. So uh, now I, I pulled the aptic and got it on time. <laughs> 
So this is the final aspect of the surgery. The recording of the video stopped here, but uh, I, I just cauterized the other attic and put it inside the sclera. It was uh, a good effect on the final of the surgery. So um, this was his sleep lamp exam. On the third day post-surgery, there was a lot of subconjunctival hemorrhage, a little corneal edema, but the IOL was in a good position, okay. as we can see on this other image as well. Uh, this is his, his little lamp exam after one month of surgery. Uh, there were no inflammatory signs. The patient reported uh, good visual acuity. And this is the other eye with only a cataract, nothing more remarkable. So at this point, his visual acuity on the left eye was counting fingers with a much better refraction, of course, and he reached 2050 with this refraction. So this little lamp exam uh, showed you on the photos would be nothing more remarkable. So what we see in his tomography exam is a quite regular and symmetric astigmatism, which I was not expecting. Uh, with an approximately simulated astigmatism of 6.7. Uh, where's my mouse? So, one month later, it didn't change much. Uh, here you can see an astigmatism at some point near six diopters. So, our question here is, is if that whole amount of astigmatism is due to the corner sutures or due to IOL maybe a bad positioning or tilts or something. So what we see here is that probably almost of all of it came from the cornea, since the astigmatism is practically coincident with the refractional astigmatism. And besides that, the IOL was in a good position at the XM. So the curious of this case is that the steep axis is almost coincident with the needle incisions from the Yamani technique which made me think if it was caused by this technique. But unfortunately, I don't have a preoperative tomography. I could not imagine that this was going to happen. There is a lot of regret for not doing that. And since his refractional astigmatism for the presentation surgery was also high and almost at the same axis, it's possible to presume that this and the biopsic cytometry was then prior, the fixation was also coincident. So the regularity of the astigmatism surprised us, so we decided to correct it with a PRK surgery. He has no need for a topoguided surgery. His refractional astigmatism was something between six and a half and seven diopters. It was not easy to precise it. The patient was not a good informant. And since we can program the Exmer laser to perform an ablation of more than six cylinder diopters on Alcon EX500 that, that we have here on Unifest, uh, I treated also a little bit less of the spherical power in order to try to maintain the spherical equivalent near plano. So I could, of course, have treated two times in a row and reached seven diopters but uh, I thought that it was not necessary at this point. So I programmed the machine an ablation of uh, plus uh, three with minus six on 115 axis. And we also performed the fake emulsification on the right eye one month after. So this is the final result. After three months of the PRK, we can see that there is still some astigmatism left at the same axis, something near one and a half and two diopters. Uh, even the auto refraction giving uh, plus one and a half with minus two and a half, the patient didn't improve with this refraction, still preferred plano, which was so his, his final uh, refraction. So um, this uh, just only for comparison uh, before and after. So believe it or not, the final visual acuity without correction was 2030. His right eye became a little bit myopic uh, post falco emulsification. This was an, an good result. Uh, I prescribed spectacles, but the patient probably didn't make them because he was already happy with his visual acuity without correction. It was practically a monovision. So, and he was not too demanding with his near vision. 
And so I, I think it was a case with a good result that made me learn a lot during my fellowship program here, surgically and clinically, and a complex case that demanded knowledge from different areas. And that is the, the real life on our practice, on our medical practice. So, thank good. you very much. Great. Very nice. Congratulations, Daniel. Nice case. Thank you so much, Daniel. Excellent. Thank Daniel, you. just a, one question here. Uh, just someone wrote in the chat, which IOL do you usually use for Yamani? So to, to do the uh, Yamani surgery, you have to use an IOL that has uh, an aptic that you can manipulate a lot and doesn't break or something. So usually we use the Sensar of, from, from Johnson, but at this case it, specifically, I used uh, the Alcon Type 7B because uh, it was the, the IOL that they are provided on the public health care here in Brazil. So this is what, uh, the, it was the IOL that we had here. But I think there are uh, better ones. And usually when I have the option, uh, I usually use the Sensar AR48. Uh, may I comment on that? Yeah. Uh, I think it's a very important question because this technique was designed for one uh, lens specifically, which is the Lucia Fronzais. They have the PVDF haptics, which has a very nice memory. Uh, by contrast, when you use the sensor, uh, the MA60 or even the Technis, they, if, you, if you get back in, our, in your uh, video, you can see the, 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 the haptic was bented a little yeah. bit. And it's very easy to, ha to have tilt distortion with this kind of hapticus. That's my only concern with this technique. One of my concerns with this technique. In, in Brazil, we don't have the Lucia available for us yet. It's, it's, it's coming, but it's not ready yet. So that's the problem. You have to mani extra manipulate the haptics. Uh, you can bend it, you can damage, and it's very easy to deformate these hapticus. And you got a well center or nice well center, not not so center I well and tilted, which is worse than the center. And you have to remove or change your your. You see right now uh, in your right, you, you just stretch a lot. Yeah. The, the tip here, you you maybe have to cut and make it symmetrically with the other side. Otherwise, you have a disintegration between both sides. Uh, comment or um, question too. Um, it's not usual to have this amount of against of the rule astigmatism, right? Usually. So, do you think that this astigmatism could be induced by the first surgery? Yes. So, you have some loose suture in that place and that induce this against of the rule astigmatism? Yeah. If that is the case, could be better to, you know, to rest sutures or even have a, a tight suture on that place before to the second surgery? I, I think that uh, actually... I mean, this is a question for also Frederico Mauro. I mean, right. not only, we, we don't want to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, uh, that was my question, Daniel. You were very, very uh, kind, Louis. You, you were very kind in the way you asked that question, but it's a very good <laughs> question because just to add on top of this, this is no doubt has to be surgically induced at the initial surgery. I don't see any yes. other possibility. And yeah. these wounds can be unstable. So although we can correct the astigmatism now, especially with a superior wound that's probably six, seven, eight millimeters, over time, this astigmatism can continue and get and worsen. And so the PRK may help now, which by the way, I was very impressed. It corrected six diopters almost. That's a lot of astigmatism with PRK too. I, I, was, I was impressed with that. Uh, I just, I, and you can't complain with the result, uh, of course. And I think... For your third case, by the way, I think that was great. That yeah. was great. So yeah. maybe you should apply for the fellowship versus Tiziana, but that's another story. <laughs> There's a question that Louis asked. That's a very good question, actually. What was the difference between the first and the second surgery, Daniel? I don't remember that. Uh, the first surgery was a, a FACO that turned into an extracapsular vasectomy. But the gap between 
uh, the, how many days or months? To the vitrectomy, I think one day. And to the fixation, uh, maybe 60 days or two months, approximately. I think it's important to this, raise, this question has been raised because it's very important to know how to convert yeah. FACO to an extra cap. This is a, I think it's a perfect example of uh, uh, probably the, the clear cornea was enlarged. Mm -hmm. So you induce a lot of astigmatism. Yeah. So in this case, this, this, uh, this main incision should have been abandoned and make a sclerotunnel or a limbo incision, uh, which would be more predictable for yeah. controlling astigmatism. Yeah. Although it was very nice, this, the, 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 the way you did, because it's very nice to, it's very important the surgeon to know how to stop. Yeah. So you have a complication, you did a vitrectomy, and you should have put or insert the lens at the same moment. But to the, the patient's discomfort, or even the physician discovered you, that uh, it was chosen to, to stop the surgery and make a, a third step, which was much safer for, for the patient. I yeah. think you managed very nicely with this case. Thank you very much. <laughs> Just a question. Sorry, uh, Daniel, uh, one question. Did you make it or the patient was vitrectomized before? Because I didn't see any vitrectomy during the surgery and the, the video um, showed. He, he did the FACO that was complicated, and one day uh, after, he did a vitrectomy uh, with the retina thing. And then, like two months after that, I did the Yamani. So I chose the Yamani because I was still learning, and the patient was already vitrectomized. So it was a good case. The patient was, uh, the state was perfect on a fixation, to start a fixation. Let me make a few comments here that I think will be nice. Uh, this morning we had this outstanding tips and tricks uh, webinar with Ike and other friends, and they were saying that how we can improve our videos. And in, in this outstanding case, Daniel, your finger shows up too much. So it would be nice, take the fingers away because this helps us to, to look at and the video looks better than that. My question, my first question would be, how do you prefer to keep the eye pressure? Uh, anterior chamber devices, such as the, the, the one you use it or maybe scleral uh, infusion techniques. For this particular case, you think the anterior chamber device is better than the pars plana uh, infusion? Uh, I think you, you have to choose what you have uh, more ability. So I'm an anterior surgeon. I don't have experience for, for, scleral, for, for doing a, a posterior access. So I, I'm used to, to use an anterior chamber maintainer. And uh, I, I've tried uh, one time to, uh, to start the surgery without uh, any uh, the anterior chamber maintainer or anything, and it's a complete disaster. So it, it works for me, and, and that's why I chose this way. Yeah, I think I think uh, I think you do what you're comfortable with. Absolutely, I think a maintainer is really critical here. I, if you do get a chance to use the posterior infusion line, I think it just really maintains the integrity of the globe uh, a little easier. Um, and I just want to point out, you know, if you can show the, your video, your just look at the screen right now in front of you, and if you can move the cursor away, no, no, pause it, pause it, pause it, pause it, and then move the uh, move that little slider away. So just yeah, put your yeah there. So. Yeah, look at that. First of all, I want to point out two things here. Okay, there's two things I want to point out. One, look at that corneal incision. Look, look how wide it is and how wide it is. Yeah. Uh, there's a pretty big gape that's there, right? That kind of t gives us an answer. This patient has seven diopters of astigmatism before this secondary operation. So that's one thing. Well, I think that's probably what, we're, what everyone's kind of keen on. I think there's some comments on the chat group. Could the IO be tilted? And you've mentioned this already, looked at it, which, you know, I think the cornea explains it. Second thing is, listen, you did a great job. I mean, I'm very impressed. This is your third case. So I hope you are not hard on yourself. You said it's a difficult, no. this is actually fine. This is actually you know, quite fine. 
And thirdly, I want to, everyone wants to know who is sex 1958? Uh, <laughs> well, it's not me. <laughs> At the top uh, of your screen, next to your battery there. Oh, it's sex is Sesta Feira that is Friday. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Because everybody was getting very excited, very excited. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> if not, was very fast and a smart answer, you know. Very yeah. smart answer, very fast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was too fast. It seems to be a reminder. <laughs> Dark questions. <laughs> Sex time. Yes, uh, maybe just to teach and propose. Yeah. Sometimes, of course, you don't have the. Uh, have a history of the patient uh, and you don't have maybe a topography but always uh, guys take a look to the other eye so if the other eye don't have too much you know against the rule that this case so we want to be pretty sure that maybe it's induced by by the first surgery right so always look always look the other eye and also again for teaching purpose the if you put anterior maintenance you're going to induce more fluid who can push more the lens behind, you see, in the moments that you are trying to, to put it. So maybe procedure, of course, but this is like a really, congratulations, really nice case. So, and this is the idea, this is the idea, learn. Uh, One yeah. thing that is very interesting is the corneal thickness at the, at the area of the old incision. As I show it us, the cornea is a little whitish, and you can see here that the cornea is almost one millimeter thick. So this is not normal, uh, definitely. Uh, what I think is probably the first surgeon just spread out the incision to remove, you know, to try to clean up the area and left a big gap on the incision. So if you, if you are able to identify the source of the astigmatism, try to manage at the source. Go for the source of astigmatism and try to manage it. So if the source is the incision, try to manage the incision. I think this is, would be another option when you have this kind of case. Great. Yes. So Mauro, what you mean is just probably to put some stitches right there a little bit tight just in order to control the astigmatism? No, I, I, I mean, if you think about a long follow-up, probably try to correct the incision. If, you, if this patient wants, you know, a fast recovering option, so PRK is a good option. But if you can't place in any stitches and leave this patient, patient plus two at, this, uh, at the surgery room, this is the ideal in long term. I'd say that even if you can try a manual keratoscope, but ideally this patient should leave the room with a plus two, plus three maximum astigmatism with the stitches on. Then you can just remove it after a month, after three months, and try to control this astigmatism. Because the spherical equivalent was zero. So it's like plus three minus six, perfect case, to manage the incision, I think. Yep. I think that I think the best answer would have been if you if you tilted the lens the opposite axis. This would have been perfect for you. Oh yeah, that's <laughs> definitely <laughs> on purpose. Uh, <laughs> and regarding the technique, Daniel, I think you, one thing you could have done to avoid uh, the the IOL to I went back to the eye and almost dropped to the vitreous cavity is when you remove the first hept, make the flange. Yeah. So you can secure it. Yeah. Because the, the so original I, technique, you have to pull uh, at the same time and then... Yeah, the original, yes. No question. But, uh, but I think uh, the, your way is the best way, and I learned it. Uh, and another question I have for you. Uh, after the surgery, uh, the, the flange was able to, to be seen through the conjunctiva or not? Uh, almost not. Yeah, that's the best result because this should be not visible through the conjunctiva. Should be entirely buried into the sclera to avoid erosion. 
which is very common to see in, in other cases, in other videos. We always see the conjunctiva, uh, the, the flange through the conjunctiva, which is not a, a, good, uh, 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 a good option in the future. You were able to see the sclera a little bit deformed in the, the place, but, but not the, the attic. Yes. So I know that actually one of, one of our Canadian team members will also be showing you a money technique, to not, not to put the cat out of the bag, but I think it'll come up again. So we'll be able to uh, show uh, the Canadian way. All right. Good. <laughs> Which I don't want to get your hopes up too high, so don't get too excited. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate the invitation. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Excellent. So you run for the second case. Te gusta bañar. Yes. Good. Perfect. Can you hear me? Yep, perfectly well. Okay. So good evening, everybody. My name is Marilia. I'm a surgical optics fellow in Paulista School of Medicine. And I'm going to present a case that came into our emergency room last week. It's about a 74-year-old female Asian patient born and raised in Sao Paulo. And she complained about redness and pain in the left eye for four days associated to headache and nausea. She also referred low visual acuity in the left eye for three years. Her past ophthalmological history was remarkable. In her ophthalmological exam, she had the, vis the best visual acuity of 2040 in the right eye and hands motion in the left eye. In the biomicroscopy, she had a clear conjunctiva, a clear cornea, uh, a nuclear cataract and a shallow anterior chamber in the right eye. In the left eye, she had a conjunctival injection, a corneal edema, a mid-dilated pupil, a intumescent cataract, and a very shallow anterior chamber. Her IOP was 14 in the right eye and 65 in the left eye. Uh, at the gonioscopy, she had the posterior portion of the trabecular meshwork not visible in 180 degrees in the right eye, and in 360 degree in the left eye. In the fundoscopy of the right eye was normal and we could not see the fundoscopy of the left eye. So we asked for an ultrasound that showed no, no attachment or no uh, any mess. So for the diagnostic hypothesis, we thought about a primary angle closure suspect in the right eye because of the occludable angle. And we thought about a morphic glaucoma in, because uh, causing this secondary angle closure in the left eye. So for the management, we uh, prescribed systemic acetazolamide topical timolol, brimonidine, and latinoprost. And we asked for preoperative evaluation, biometry, and to schedule a uh, heart in the left eye. So this is a picture of the right eye. We took it in the operating room, so we cannot see many details. I'm sorry about that. And this is the left eye with a hyperemic conjunctiva, a white intumescent cataract. The anterior chamber was very shallow, but we unfortunately, we cannot see in this picture. In the day of the surgery, the IOP was 45, even with all the medications. So we decided to do intravenous mannitol to lower the vitreous pressure. And also, we decided to make a sclerotomy with a 23 gauge needle to perform a vitrectomy of the core vitreous to lower even more the IOP and avoid any positive pressure during the surgery.
So here I measure four millimeters away from the limbus in the temporal inferior region. 